climate change experts by a long way. Um, we have, it, this isn't a very detailed talk about the climate modeling or cutting edge solutions to do with climate change. We're just here as more <coughs> Oxford residents, really. But saying, I mean, we have the Environmental Change Institute down the road who do fantastic talks like that. But saying that, how we're not experts, Rachel actually does have a PhD, and she does actually know actual stuff about science. Um, <laughs> I can't even do percentages. <laughs> okay, so why, why is it that we're here doing this talk um, tonight? So like Zahra was just saying, so I don't have a background in science. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Sheffield, um, and I've been studying the impacts that climate change is having on high latitude ecosystems for the last six years. Um, and during that time, I've also kind of increasingly felt that um, if you are a scientist and if you believe in your science, then you also have a certain level of responsibility to be an advocate for that science. Um, so that's why I've also got involved with Extinction Rebellion here in Oxford. Um, and so I'm going to be leading the first half of this talk, and that's just going to be a clear, simple roundup of the latest science of where we are on climate change. A lot of you in here probably would have heard at least some of that information before, um, but I think there's still, there's still real value in just talking through the full picture, um, if nothing else, just to kind of remind ourselves of the seriousness of the situation that we're talking about. And I'll be leading the second half of the talk. Is my mic still on? No. I'll be leading the second half yes. of the talk. Yes, great. Um, I'll be leading the second half of the talk, and in that I'll be... Uh, demonstrating to you how our current political systems are completely failing to take um, adequate action for the severity of the situation. I'll also be explaining why we think that non-violent direct action is an appropriate response to the, to the crisis that we're facing. And I'll also tell you a little bit about how you can actually get involved. And that how you can get involved part is a little bit of a reflection of like my own journey really over the last um, six months. So, like many people here, I, I've known about climate change for years and years. I grew up knowing about global warming. I came from a very kind of active political family. Um, my first, uh, my job um, at, out of university was to stop climate chaos, a climate change coalition organization. And that was 15 years ago, and it felt urgent then. And I went on marches, and I signed petitions, and I wrote to my MP, and I did all of those things, the sorts of things that you guys probably do all the time as well. And then in my 20s, I became increasingly distracted from the whole thing. And I would see headlines on the news, you know, more and more warnings from scientists. I would see more and more extreme weather events happening. And I would scroll past and I would think, oh, this is very, very bad. But I didn't know what to do about it. I felt very disempowered and very despairing. But more than that, I felt quite numb. Like I just didn't really feel anything. And then the Paris Climate um, Agreement happened. And I was like, yes, brilliant, it's all been sorted out. Um, I wasn't engaged, and now I don't have to be, because somebody else has done something about it. Yay, Obama. And then Brexit happened, and then Trump happened, and then the IPCC report came out last autumn, and then in quick succession, the WWF report came out, the Living Planet Report. And I suddenly re-engaged really quickly, but it was awful, like I felt completely overwhelmed, um, full of despair, and, and, and very, very powerless. Um, and then about at that same moment, um, I met this boy, who I really fancied, and <laughs> um, he told me about Extinction Rebellion, and because that's what you do when people who you fancy tell you things, I went and looked them up. And I was like, oh my god, these guys actually uh, are actually responding with the urgency. They're actually talking about this in the urgent way that I think this needs to be talked about. And I watched some videos, and I read some stuff, and quite apart from the beautiful boy, I went off to a training weekend, and I learned about Extinction Rebellion. And barely a week after the training weekend, I was on the streets of London taking action. And so I can say, personally, that the moment that you start to do something, everything feels a whole lot better. So that's what... <laughs> Um, with the climate strikes that I'm sure we've all been hearing about. 
and of course you're going to be hearing a bit more um, from George as well. Um, but I think, so let's just get started now. Um, so when we talk about climate change, um, and, and the way that I've been trained to talk about climate change for years now, is uh, to be optimistic, to focus on the positive stories that we can find. And that can be a really powerful thing, but it does also come with a real risk that we never actually sit down and face the reality of the situation that we're in, and instead we create what is really this, this false sense of security. So because of that, we're not going to do that today. We're actually going to take a step back, and we're going to be guided by this core Extinction Rebellion principle of tell the truth and act as if the truth is real. This isn't always an easy thing to do, um, and because of that, you might at you know, points during this talk, you might find yourself feeling sad or, or afraid or angry. Um, and we just really want to make the point that those feelings are completely appropriate and completely rational. And I'd really encourage you not to turn away from those feelings, but actually to, to sit with them um, and really face up to them. Because we don't actually get the chance to do that very often, and it's a really important part of looking, looking at where we are and how we move forward. So the first thing I just want to talk about is the information that we have about climate change. What is the nature of this information? Um, in science, we build knowledge through this process of uh, review and consensus building. So that means we go right from um, individual work, individual publications, from individual scientists, through to something like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And during that process, all the science in a field, so in this case climate change, is really intensively debated and critiqued and just really pulled apart by that scientific community. And what that means is that the conclusions that survive that process are really rigorous. So when we're talking about the IPCC, we're talking about really mainstream, completely non-controversial science. However, it also means that those conclusions are the ones that the most, uh, the most cautious and reticent members of that community are prepared to stand behind. So, as well as being very rigorous, these conclusions can potentially be viewed as fairly conservative. But despite that, I'm sure many of us in here um, have, well, probably most of us have heard about, probably some of us have read the latest IPCC report, which came out late last year. And this looked at the difference in the impacts of climate change at one and a half degrees compared to two degrees. And the conclusions of this were really quite stark. So what the report found was that impacts at two degrees are much worse than the impacts we see at one and a half degrees, and therefore that we must, if at all possible, keep to this one and a half degree limit. Um, but it's really important to say that that one and a half degree limit, that is not, that's not a safe level of climate change. We still see dangerous and severe impacts of climate change at one and a half degrees. And just to kind of emphasize what this report really means, I just want to share with you what um, some of the scientists representing this, um, this mainstream, fairly conservative process um, have to say about the report. So Eric Solheim, Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, says it's like a deafening, piercing smoke alarm going off in the kitchen. We must put out the fire. Deborah Roberts, um, is chair of one of the IPCC working groups, says it's a line in the sand and what it says to our species is that this is the moment and we must act now. The next few years are probably the most important in our history. So what is this situation that we should all be so alarmed by? Where are we with climate change? This is the amount of warming we have experienced to date. So you can see it varies hugely across the world, but what we're looking at is an average temperature increase across the world of one degree. Already at this one degree of warming, we are seeing substantial detectable impacts um, on the natural world, particularly vulnerable ecosystems like coral reefs. We're seeing impacts on, um, on extreme events, on our ability to grow crops uh, in many parts of the world, um, and even on things like human related mortality. Unquestionably, climate change is already changing and ending people's lives around the world. This is at one degree of warming. So what does the future hold? On this graph, the black line is showing you the emissions that we've 
that have happened so far. And I'm going to, just going to talk you through um, three kind of examples of what could potentially happen next. So firstly, let's imagine that we just wave a magic wand and we stop all our emissions now. So of course warming doesn't stop immediately, the same way your car doesn't stop immediately when you apply the brakes. So we do see some additional warming. And that actually takes us to somewhere between around uh, 1.3 to 1.7 degrees of warming by the end of this century. But this is, this is our magic wand scenario. This is not possible, we know that. So instead, let's imagine that we don't do this, but we do keep all the promises we've made around the world to tackle climate change, including the pledges we've so far made under the Paris Agreement on climate change. What happens then? If we do that, we see warming at the moment of around three degrees by the end of this century. So that's our optimistic policies scenario there. So that's double that line in the sand that the IPCC have drawn for us. At this level of warming, we see um, more or less loss of coral reefs, loss of some Arctic sea ice. We see severe to extreme impacts in terms of inland flooding, coastal flooding, other extreme events. Um, crop failure, heat-related mortality, impacts on fisheries. In addition to these things, we see a high risk of abrupt, irreversible impacts of climate change. Finally, what happens if we carry on behaving the way we're behaving today? If we do that, so business as usual, that takes us into this grey area up here, which, as you can see, leads to around four degrees or more of warming by the end of this century according to the IPCC, as much as six degrees. This is beyond catastrophic as a scenario. This is something that we really, we can't know or really understand the impact of this. These scenarios are based on what we, well, describe what we expect to see um, based on our emissions. Do we always see what we expect with climate change? Um, this is an animation that's not going to work, so I'm just going to tell you what, it, what it's going to show. <laughs> so, what it would show you is the extent and the thickness of sea ice in the Arctic. And for several years we saw a period of steady decline in the, in the extent of sea ice, which is what we expected to see. And then, from around the late 2000s, we saw that the area of the really the thickest the multi-year ice dropped to just a fraction of what it had been just a few years before, around the millennium, um, in, in just a few years. And that's what this looked like in comparison to what we expected to see at the time. So why do we see things that we don't <coughs> expect with climate change? We can't answer this whole question now, but to start doing that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about feedbacks and tipping points. So this is an example of a feedback loop. This, in this case, this is the albedo effect. We all, we all understand what this is. It, the albedo effect is the reason that if you go outside on a hot day wearing a white t-shirt, you don't get as hot as if you're wearing a black t-shirt. In this case, what we see happening is that as the climate warms, sea ice melts, and we replace that white reflective surface with something really dark and absorbent. And that dark absorbency takes up more heat, we see more ice melting, and we enter this, this vicious cycle that is a feedback loop. And that causes the process, so in this case of sea ice melt, to accelerate. This is an example of a feedback loop that we understand quite well. But there are lots of other feedback loops and lots of them we really don't have such a good understanding of. So this example is the weakening of our natural sinks. By natural sinks, I mean uh, forests and other ecosystems that naturally take up carbon and slow down climate change for us. But climate change is weakening the ability of these natural sinks to do that. For example, because forests are drying out, or for example, because um, they're being attacked more and more by um, insects which thrive in the warmer, drier conditions we're creating. So this image, the top left, this is forest in British Columbia, in Canada. And all of the red coloration there is trees that have been killed by an outbreak of a single species of beetle. This outbreak, this single outbreak, caused more CO2 emissions than 40 years of wildfires across Canada. And you can imagine that trying to build these processes into our predictions of the future is very difficult. In addition, there's 
There's lots of other processes going on with natural sinks that we understand even less. Just an example, this is what I work on. This is the dieback of plant communities in the Arctic. This is something that is linked to climate change. It's happening more and more often, and it's weakening the Arctic carbon sink. But we didn't even know that this was happening until just a few years ago, and we were actually expecting the opposite to be happening. So with these processes that we don't have a good understanding of, often these are not fully represented or not represented in our predictions of the future. As somebody who, who works on some of these things, that is something that I find really genuinely frightening. So in addition to these processes, which we're not really certain about uh, necessarily, we also have the complete unknowns, the just total surprises that are out there for us. This is a paper that was published less than a month ago, and it's looking at quite an extreme scenario. It's looking at business as usual in terms of our emissions for about another century. And what it finds is that in that scenario, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere get so high that actually cloud banks, so large kind of expanses of cloud, disperse quite abruptly. And what that does is add an extra eight degrees of warming on top of the warming that we would expect to see as a result of emissions by that point. I'm not sharing this with you because I think we should all be really frightened about that eight degrees. Um, I don't think we should. I don't think this is a scenario, this is extreme. As I said, I don't think this would come to pass. But I'm sharing it with you because I think it's a really important reminder that as we create this increasingly unfamiliar world, there are going to be surprises. And as this scientist says, those surprises are probably not going to be pleasant. We can't talk about um, unexpected things with climate change without talking about tipping points as well. So tipping points is this idea that climate change sort of reaches a threshold after which some of those impacts kind of run away from us like a wall rolling down a hill when suddenly it accelerates and you can't, you can't grab it back. Um, and again, this isn't something that's a kind of disaster movie scenario. This is a quote from the IPCC report. And it's saying that even in the region of temperature increase that we're kind of aiming for, one and a half to two degrees, there's a moderate risk of tipping points. Um, in this case, um, of um, destabilisation of, um, well, ice loss from Greenland um, and Antarctica, which of course would be associated with a substantial level of, of sea level rise. So what does all this mean for that graph we looked at um, of the scenarios of where we could be heading based on our emissions? I think what it means is that we have to remember that our predictions of the future are terrifying, but also not based on a complete picture, and therefore that we can't treat these, these ranges of uncertainty as, as safety nets. Um, we, we know we're already off the map in terms of the climate that we know, and as we head further and further into this, into this grey area up here, we know less and less really about what we're letting ourselves in for. Having said that, there are, there are some things we know about what we're letting ourselves in for. So we're going to talk just quickly a little bit about that. Um, so firstly, one of those things is, of course, sea level rise. It's one of the things that comes to mind uh, most often. Sea level rise is something that will affect hundreds of millions, potentially up to a billion people around the world. And a lot of people in the UK. In the UK, something like 30% of people live within 10 kilometres of the coast. Um, this is um, a graphic, obviously, of London. Um, the amount of flooding that we, well, inundation that we see in London, just under two degrees. It's for context. Um, there's the O2, the O2 I think has moved a little bit. Um, but you can actually see where the O2 is supposed to be, this little island, um, which is a little bit frightening. And of course, this is a substantial level of inundation. But we also have to remember that other places around the world will see much more severe impacts. Um, so this is Shanghai, the surrounding area which you can see is largely um, inundated, and um, this is Miami, which is completely obliterated. Sea level rise isn't the only way that we'll lose land to climate change. We're already losing land to <coughs> desertification. And in addition, as temperatures continue to rise, and particularly as we see more variable, unpredictable rainfall, it will become increasingly hard to grow crops in many parts of the world. This is um, showing you global hunger, which has been on a steady decline for several years. And in the, just the last few years, 
that trend has actually reversed and it's now back up on the increase. And this report cited climate change and climate-related shocks as a key driver of this increase in global hunger. This is at one degree of warming. Of course, all these things also mean that people will be on the move. This estimate suggests that um, climate change could result in 150 billion, uh, million to 2 billion uh, migrants within borders and across borders uh, by 2050. If we take the midpoint of those estimates, we're talking about something like one in nine people being on the move by 2050. And we only really need to think about the last few years to imagine the kind of political and social consequences of this. But of course, this is also about the human cost. Um, the human cost of migration is enormous. And just to reflect that, um, we have this quote from Moving Stories, which is a climate outreach report, which I encourage you all to read, um, from the slavery in Bangladesh, who says, climate change has wrecked everything. Our people are living in other towns and cities like refugees. All I wanted was to grow old with my children and their children. But now they're gone, and I don't think they will ever return. Another key impact of climate change is more extreme events. This is something we all know we're seeing already. This is just a picture, this is a photo I took of my laptop screen last summer because I just could not believe that more than half of the top stories on BBC News were linked to extreme events linked to climate change. <coughs> and again, this is another, another key point that is not just about numbers on a screen. This is about human cost. And with extreme events and with other impacts of climate change, often that human cost is, is particularly affecting people in the global south, women, children, uh, people of colour, people whose voices we are least likely to hear. And just in recognition of that, I'm just going to hand over to Sahura, for, um, who's going to read a testimony um, from Min Min Ai, who survived um, Cyclone Nargis, which made landfall in Myanmar in 2008. On the 2nd of May 2008, Min Min Ai, her husband, and their two daughters, aged three and six, took their boat to a nearby island to buy wood. The family lived from selling timber in Bagare, another town. The family planned to sleep in the boat. They saw nothing unusual in the wind, which gathered steadily through the afternoon. By 9 p.m., it had reached a force so frightening that they abandoned the small craft for the shore and scuttled into the first house they could find. Some 25 others were already cowering there. As the cyclone approached, it drove massive waves up the vast tidal river that drained from the Ayawadi Delta into the Indian Ocean. The floodwater surged over the island where Min Min Ai's family were marooned, tearing the house from its stilt legs and driving its collapsing structure into a nearby haystack. I couldn't see anything. All I know is that people were grabbing the haystack and trying to hold on to each other as the water pulled at us. My husband and I held hands and we each held one of the children. Cast into the water, the couple grabbed the branches of a tree only to be swallowed up in the drifting haystack. Min Min Ai lost her husband's hand forever. Minutes later, she said the realisation crept over her that life was also slipping from her three-year-old daughter, who was still in her grasp. Stricken by grief, she gave herself up to the current, preferring to hold the tiny body of her daughter than try to save herself. Although I knew my little daughter was dead, I told myself I would never let her go. The wind and the water had been too much for her and she became as limp as a piece of cloth. Min Min Ai said she slipped in and out of consciousness until fortune saw her washed up on another island. Bits of wood were piling on top of me and I was stuck beneath them. I struggled to get out and I realised I had let go of my child. I tried to grab her, again if I could only find her leg. <coughs> then another wave hit us and because her body was so slippery, I lost her. So this is hard hitting stuff, um, but it's important we face up to it. When we talk about the victims of climate change um, and of ecological breakdown, of course we're not just talking about, about people, we're also talking about other species. This graphic is um, just showing the observed numbers of extinctions um, in comparison to what, we'd, to what we'd expect, which you can see in the purple down near the bottom. 
And this is telling us, um, of course, what we, what we all know, which is that we are in the sixth global mass extinction. And um, I'm sure, again, lots of us heard about the WWF Living, Living Planet report, which came out last year and told us that just since the 1970s, we had wiped out 60% of animal populations. This is a really difficult number to kind of comprehend. So for context, if we did that with human populations, we'd be talking about emptying North America, South America, Europe, Africa, China, and Oceania. I have double checked that. Um, and so this is about a loss of numbers, a uh, loss of abundance, as well as the loss of individual species. Both of those things contribute to the ecological <coughs> crisis um, that we find ourselves in. And when we were preparing this talk, Sarah and I were just talking about how, how it's really difficult to actually see this loss of abundance. Our baselines um, shift over time. Each generation thinks the amount of nature that they see is normal. Um, and I actually think this book that um, I've been reading recently kind of encapsulates that really well. So I'm just going to read you this little passage from it. In the dark, there are far, far more moths out and about than ever there are butterflies during the daytime. It's just that we don't see them. Or at least we didn't until the invention of the automobile. The headlight beams of a speeding car on a muggy summer's night in the countryside, turning the moths into snowflakes and crowding them together the faster you went in the manner of a telephoto lens, meant that the true, startling scale of their numbers was suddenly apparent, not least as they plastered the headlights and the windscreen until driving became impossible and you had to stop the car to wipe the glass surfaces clean. Of all the myriad displays of abundance in the natural world in Britain, the moth snowstorm was the most extraordinary. Yet now, after but a short century of existence, it has gone. So, let's come on to this question that we, we really posed with the title of this talk. Could, could climate change possibly, well, climate change and ecological breakdown possibly be enough to wipe out humanity? Um, and I think, I think, to tackle this question, we have to really think about the significance it is of what we're asking. So we said right at the start of this talk that we know climate change is changing and ending people's lives around the world. We know that we're currently heading to overshoot scenarios, which will almost certainly cause unprecedented levels of human suffering. So given that, should it really take a threat of complete human extinction to motivate us to act? Or do we genuinely feel comforted by the idea that whatever happens, somewhere, some people will survive? But despite that, let's take this as a theoretical question of could this, could this be possible? Um, and to do that, I'm just going to draw your attention to um, one paper which was published in PNAS um, in 2017 which looked at this question, um, and it looked at low probability, high impact climate change scenarios, including scenarios where climate change is an existential threat. <coughs> um, so those are scenarios with a probability of 5%. I'm just going to read you a quote from one of the authors of this paper, and then we're actually, we're just going to take a minute of complete quiet just to absorb some of what we've talked about so far tonight. So I'll read you the quote. When we say 5% probability high impact event, people may dismiss it as small. But it's equivalent to a 1 in 20 chance the plane you're about to board will crash. We would never get on that plane with a 1 in 20 chance of it coming down. But we are willing to send our children and grandchildren on that plane. <coughs> so let's just take a minute to process this and then we'll move on to the second half of the talk. We'll bring you back to us then.
Okay, everybody, thank you. The minute's up. So, thank you for being with us this far. Um, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to be talking about action. I can't promise any hope, but I can definitely promise a bit more power and joy than we saw in the first half of the talk. And I'm also going to explain why we just put you through a fairly intense 25 minutes. Um, it was, there was a good reason for it, and it will become clear as I talk about action and motivation. So, <coughs> this is me, so. Um, I think we can all agree from Rachel's slides that we are facing an emergency on an unprecedented level, right? I think we can all be, be sure of that. Um, but our political representatives are taking measures which are far from sufficient to tackle this. And in fact, they're almost actively worsening it. So if you look at the UK government's record in the last 10 years, you can see <coughs> scrapping renewable energy schemes, voting for the expansion of Heathrow, which is probably the most carbon-intensive infrastructure project imaginable, and um, selling off the Green Investment Bank, a whole ton of, of um, policies. But we live in a functioning democratic system, right? I mean, kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 we've got the latest. Um, so you think that in, uh, compared globally, we do, right? And we have checks and balances and we have a judiciary. So you would think that they would be holding successive governments to account to stop this kind of stuff from happening. Um, but actually, that isn't the case. So this is an organisation called Plan B, and they took the UK government to court last year in July 2018 for acting contrary to um, climate change commitments of Paris and causing serious harm to human welfare and breaching international obligations. And Parliament's very own Climate Change <coughs> Committee confirmed that the Paris Agreement describes a higher level of ambition than the one which forms the basis of the UK's legislated emission reductions target. But Plan B is still lost. The High Court didn't do anything about it. So, given this, what is an appropriate social response to this situation? The normal channels are not working. There's a clue in the name, Extinction Rebellion. We believe that we need to rebel. Now, the rhetoric around rebellion is very much associated with the left. Um, you know, revolutions and, and that kind of thing. But we believe that actually climate change poses a threat to the values of everyone on every political persuasion. And actually rebellion is an appropriate response, whatever your political perspective. So, we have some old friends from GB101, I'm quite excited <coughs> to see them again, um, Locke and Hobbes. So, climate change is a threat to the individual property rights that liberals hold so, so dear. Uh, it's tens if not hundreds of thousands of UK homes are going to get flooded, are going to get damaged by storms. This is a clear violation of property rights. Um, and, and the rights of our children are certainly not guaranteed. So Locke said, he had a thing called the right of revolution. And he said, when a government fails to protect the lives and livelihoods of its citizens, the people have a right to rebel. And then we have Hobbes, dear old Hobbes. Um, the conservative perspective about climate change and rebellion is really not ever examined or ever talked about enough. And it's kind of strange because climate change is diametrically opposed to the idea of conserving the status quo. And it's a threat multiplier. So it makes war and terrorism and all those threats to national security and to order itself much, much greater. And those are the cornerstones of conservative thought. And Hobbes um, said that when um, the state er er derives authority from its willingness and ability to maintain order and security, and the obligation of the subject to the sovereign lasts as long and no longer than the power lasts by which he is able to protect them. So Hobbes is kind of saying, you've got a case to rebut. <laughs> so that's great, we've got some theory, but what are we rebelling for? We're not just talking about like random uprising in the streets for no particular reason at all. Definitely not. Extinction Rebellion has three demands. 
So, demand one is that the government must tell the truth about the ecological emergency, reverse inconsistent policies, and work alongside the media to communicate with citizens. So governments conduct public health campaigns based on accurate scientific evidence all the time. Sleep belts, drink driving, all kinds of things. And we're essentially asking for the same thing. We're saying don't shy away from the truth, tell the truth and give your citizens accurate information so that we can have mass behaviour change and also so they understand when, what, where we're going and what policies need to be put in place. Demand two. The government must enact legally binding policy measures to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2025 and cooperate so we're part of a global economy which runs on half a planet's worth of resources per year. So this is pretty ambitious. The IPCC says net zero by 2050. But we know from Rachel's slides that leaves out a whole load of known unknowns and a load of more terrifyingly unknown unknowns. So we're kind of we're kind of like saying <coughs> so, I'm at, so you've got a teenage child or a young adult child, parent, there are many parents here in the room, and they've got a really, really important um, job interview and they've got to get a train to go there. To, to go. And you say to them the night before, oh what time is the train? <coughs> oh it's a 907. Oh so what time are you going to get to the station? Oh there's a bus that gets me there at 903. And you'd be like, mm, how about getting on the earlier bus? <coughs> you know, there might be some traffic, there might be some delays you don't know about. No, 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 I'll get, the, I'll get the bus, it gets a 903. No, just get the earlier bus. And we're basically saying the same thing. Like, let's not, let's not kind of allow like, any feedback loops to kind of take place. Let's just aim for six years. But net carbon neutral in six years, that's quite a big ask. And lots of you might be thinking, yeah, <laughs> in your dreams. So how would we actually do that? Um, we could just we could just stick with the IPCCs uh, and, and just carry on. But you know we'll be on that bus, potentially getting missing on watching our train driving out of the station. Um, we think we can get there with something like a mobilisation like that happened in the Second World War. So in this period, the entire economy transformed almost overnight. Factories that were producing cars suddenly, within weeks, were producing something for the war effort. Over half of our national expenditure was devoted to winning the war. We had a 95% drop off in animal in foodstuff imports and a 70% drop in butter imports. So we know, from we've done it before, like it is, we know it, Politically and economically, it is feasible if we really put our minds to it. Now, with this slide, I'm not a massive patriot, and I'm certainly not a fan of war at all. But this narrative around the Blitz spirit and everybody pulling together is very, very powerful, and it doesn't belong to one end of the political spectrum. There are very many positive things about what happened in the war. And there's an academic paper which com directly compares the transformation that took place in wartime to what we, that we could learn with climate change. And they say there are some key, key things to learn. So the positive things were that there was a real sense of solidarity and shared experience. We were heading for the same thing. We knew what we were trying to do, and we were all pulling in the same direction. There was reasonable equality. So generally speaking, you couldn't buy more rations because you had more money. The people had similar amounts of stuff. And there was shared meaning. We were appealing to future generations and to the greater good. So they say there's real things that we can learn from this, um, from this time. However, there's a big downside, which is it wasn't very democratic at all. Things were just driven through and there was a big democratic deficit. And that leads us to our third demand of Extinction Rebellion. So we demand a citizens' assembly to oversee the changes as part of creating a democracy fit for purpose. So, a citizens' assembly is essentially um, populating a decision-making assembly, maybe 100 people or so, um, by selecting people at random from the population, a bit like jury service. So you have totally random and therefore hopefully representative selection of the population. And the assembly make decisions in an informed, fair manner. They are presented with the facts by experts who disclose their funding 
and they understand what's happening with climate change, and they understand about policies, and you take some time to discuss and deliberate, and it's a thoughtful process. And when citizens' assemblies are used, they actually come up with really, really good policies. And I can think of some things they could work on at the moment, but So, this is um, the Sortition Foundation. So, um, Extinction Rebellion works with this organisation called the Sortition Foundation, which are experts in setting up citizens' assemblies. And the real advantage of them is that it completely gets rid of party politics, like people aren't there representing a particular political party with a particular manifesto and there's not internal political wrangling. You're just making decisions based on the facts all together. And it also gets out of the short-term election thinking, which is kind of related. But most of all, it gets away completely from the whole lobbying and corruption and power that the carbon-heavy industries have over our elected representatives and over the system. So, citizens' assemblies have been used um, very successfully um, in Ireland. Um, they set up the terms for the referendum on gay marriage, and they also set up the terms for the referendum on abortion, and that was considered to be very fair, and it worked really well um, across the whole of Ireland. And then they were also used to uh, decide about nu uh, nuclear waste in Australia. So it has been used successfully around the world. And I wanted to mention like one small thing that happened locally in Oxford, um, which I think is an example of the kind of um, the kind of the way that politicians are hemmed in by the system, even if they know what what is right. So Extinction Rebellion went to see Emily's dots uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we said, please, can you um, oppose the expressway? And she said. Um, because it's, you know, it's ridiculous, the building new roads, there's a climate emergency, there's all the housing's going to be spread out along it, everybody who goes and um, lives in those houses will have to have cars, you're just basically setting people up for a carbon intensive lifestyle, and that's what's got to change. And she said, I can't oppose it, because if I do, then the chances of me being able to push for affordable housing along that um, road will be severely reduced. Um, and I was elected on the basis of, uh, that I would get as much affordable housing as possible in Oxford. Now, whether you agree with her analysis about whether it tied her hands on that or not, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that they have all of these things pulling them in all these different directions, all this party politics, and just more things than we probably even know. Whereas citizens' assemblies just kind of bypass all of that. And it's actually the way the Greeks originally um, set up democracy. So, these are our demands. Um, and that's what we're rebelling for. But how are we going to actually get people to do this? And what do we mean by rebelling? And will it work? And at this point, it's really important to talk about this, this uh, motto again of Extinction Rebellion. Um, tell the truth and act as if the truth is real. And this really shifts the discourse away from how climate change has been communicated in the last, I would say, 15 years or so. So, I was definitely since I was at Stop Climate Chaos, this is the this was the thing. If you're trying to motivate people, scaring the shit out of them is a really bad strategy. So the idea is um, amongst people in you know traditional environmental NGOs, in the media, all kinds of people, is that climate change is really bad. You can't tell people, you can't terrify them, you can't do what we just did on stage, because then they'll freeze, they'll become overwhelmed, and they'll completely won't act at all and it'll be counterproductive. And that's almost certainly true. But what if you're trying to motivate everybody, that's a very, very important point. But what about if you're not trying to motivate every single person? So this is a rough um, illustrative graph to show how people respond about climate change. It's not real data, it's just to illustrate my point. So we've got people over here who really don't care. Like they're not gonna do anything at all, couldn't give a shit. And then we've got people over here, committed environmental activists, who are changing their behaviour, actively changing their behaviour. And then you've got lots of people in the middle who think it's good to look after the environment, but are not actually changing their behaviour very much, or to a sort of different degree. So the idea is, if you tell them, and, and, and basically scare the shit out of them, then this will happen. And they'll just go, oh my god, this is too much. And they'll, it, they'll feel too small, they'll feel too scared, they'll run away, it, um, they'll just be completely distracted, distract themselves with whatever it is that they're interested in, love island or their children or DIY or drinking or whatever. Um, but 
What about if that isn't actually the case for everybody? What about if, when you tell the truth, this happens? You get a small bunch of people who go, oh my God, this is the most important thing that anybody has ever told me. We're heading for four degrees of warming. We've got to do something about it. And these people are called upstanders. <laughs> So these people act differently for whatever reason. They have a different mindset, um, different values, something's happened in their life. They might have a different um, religion or spiritual practice, which makes them stand up and say, I'm going to act. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to rebel for the, on behalf of the greater good based on science. So that's a nice theory. I've made some graphs. But where's the evidence of that, really? And I think... The evidence is kind of in this room tonight because you guys all came to a talk called Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It. Can you imagine a normal NGO sitting down saying, what should we call our public meeting? Oh, let's call it Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It. No, you can't call it that. Nobody will come. Yet, here you all are. So Extinction Rebellion was launched on the 31st of October last year. That's, that's not even six months ago. Like, that's a a crazy short amount of time. We had Christmas and everything. And nearly 200 people have been arrested in that time. And so I think this shows that it, isn't tr that it is true that upstanders will stand up. Loads of people will be scared and they're not interested and they don't care. But a certain number of people will stand up and, and say, this is important, I'm going to do something about this. The other thing about telling the truth is about your... and, and acting as if it's real, that's the really important part, is... Typical NGOs and, and, and awareness raising methods are leafleting, marching, uh, sending an email to your MP, doing all of those kinds of things. And they're really, really important and they, they do generate really good results for lots of issues. But actually, we don't think that's an appropriate response for an issue that's potentially existential and is urgent and there are powerful forces actively trying to stop change from happening. So we think that appropriate response is something else which I'm going to get to. But there's something here about your actions and your words matching up. So if you give somebody a leaflet and it tells them that climate change is terrible and severe and it might cause human extinction, but you've just given them a leaflet, then there was sort of the sense of kind of cross message. The implicit message is it can't be that bad because if it was that bad, surely people would be in the streets. You know, so there's a kind of a dissonance there, and I think it sort of makes people think that what you're saying isn't true. And I think this is the level of action we've got to with <laughs> the kind of say it's bad, but it's not that bad because it's too scary. My friend bought herself a bamboo toothbrush recently, and I was, she told me about it very proudly, and I was, I was very pleased for her, but. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about telling the truth is fear is actually a very useful emotion. It keeps us safe. And I don't think it is always paralyzing. It's very rational, rational to be acutely afraid of what you've just heard from Rachel. And we have three responses in the brain, which is fight, flight, and freeze. And fight and flight are both actions. So I don't think that fear is completely a, a freezing emotion. But fear-based campaigns do fail, and they fail when you don't tell people what they can do. If you just make people scared that you don't tell them what they can do, then they do totally fail. You've got to give people a sense of personal urgency. Agency, not urgency. But we've also got urgency. <laughs> so, I've told you the demands, and I've told you that we think that we can get a percentage of the population to act. But what do we mean by rebelling, exactly? And will it work? So, this is what we mean by rebelling. Strategic, non-violent, direct action. A major system of resistance based upon the assumption that hierarchical systems can be modified or destroyed by withdrawal of submission, cooperation, and obedience. There are four key principles of non uh, strategic, non-violent, direct action, particularly Extinction Rebellion's 
um, with lots and lots of, you know, it's got a long and proud history. Um, so the first principle is it must be respectful. And nonviolence isn't just limited to like not smashing somebody in the face. It's actually something much more profound than that. Um, the root of the word that we've translated into nonviolence is from Sanskrit, and the Sanskrit is a very ancient language. And there's a kind of meaning um, from the very original, which means a state of such open heartedness, there is no room for hatred. But also on a more mundane level, if you're respectful, people will like you, and then they're more likely to agree with you. But also, <laughs> In, but also, it, it um, helps limit the risk of things escalating into physical violence, which we absolutely do not um, recommend at all. The second thing is, it must be disruptive. So marches are really nice, like they're fantastic. These one day marches, and you go, and they've got really funny banners, and then you really like them, and then you look at the pictures on The Guardian the day after and say, oh, I saw that one. Um, and they're very beautiful, but, but people who are not on the marches, they just walk past, they don't care, like it doesn't, impact on their lives. So Extinction Rebellion's um, disruption is low, low level entry. So you just have to have a body and a mind and place it somewhere. It's not about having special <coughs> expertise. It's not about having to get to far away remote sites. It's not about scaling high buildings. It's economic disruption en masse, mainly in capital cities. And sacrificial. So not always sacrificial, but it's helpful. Um, so people, <coughs> if they see you striking or going to prison or doing something like that, where you are making a personal sacrifice, you get sympathy and you show you're serious, but it, and it really does capture people's imagination. So we remember the force feeding of the, of the suffragettes and the hunger of the Jarrah marchers and the poverty of striking miners who stuck with it day in, day out. And that, re and that sticks, it sticks in history. And then the first one is it creates a backfiring response. So um, one a good example of this is the FRAC 3 incidents in Preston. So a backfiring response, sorry, is when um, authorities take action which, is, um, which backfires on them because of we've taken non-violent direct action. So the FRAC 3 thing in Preston, um, there's this fracking going on and it's been going on for about a year or more now. <coughs> And lots of people were arrested, and it didn't get any media attention, and nobody really knew about it. And then um, three or four people um, took a lorry and stayed on it for about four days and nights. And they were arrested, and they were charged and then sent to prison. And it was considered to be a kind of totally disproportionate response. So there was actually quite a big outcry amongst on the media. It was the most amount of attention that the fracking in Lancashire had ever had. And people who weren't that interested still thought it was a disproportionate response. So the people don't care, if they don't care about your, your cause or they don't necessarily approve of your actions, if they <coughs> see that you've been inappropriately punished, people do get your, you do get their sympathy. So this is what we mean by rebelling, but will it work? So this is Erica Chenoweth, um, Professor of Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy. And she has studied um, a lot of non-violent um, uh, action. So she collected all of the violent and non-violent uprisings since 1900. There were over 300. She assessed them very carefully um, with criteria. There's a paper you can read if you want. Um, and she found that non-violent direct action is twice as likely to succeed as violent, direct, as violent action. But also, most importantly, you do not need everybody. You do not need everybody at all. You don't need 75% of the population, you don't need 50% of the population, you don't need 25%, you don't need 10%, you don't need 5%. The figure that she found, the upper figure that she found, was 3.5% of the population need to rebel in order to change a system. But it does depend on the type of action. So this is one of the classic. So a successful movement that used the four principles that I outlined before. And they succeeded with far, far less than 3.5% of the population. So before the mid-1950s, um, the American Civil Rights Movement was trying all the usual political channels and it wasn't really having much impact. And then from the 50s onwards, they just changed tack and they moved to nonviolent strategic direct action, 
with several hundred people going to prison and thousands of people getting arrested. And one example of the, one of those campaigns is the Freedom Riders. So um, in the southern segregated states, you couldn't go on a bus or a train. You, um, black and white people couldn't sit in the same place. And Freedom Riders deliberately sat in the place where they were not supposed to sit. It started with 13 people. That's, that's been pretty scary. Isn't it? And it ended with 400 people. In the summer of 61, just under 400 people went to prison and they deliberately chose a jail, not bail tactic. And they were sent to prison in a quite a grotty, horrible prison. And it really aroused <coughs> the sympathy um, of the American public and it really got a lot of media attention. And within a year, they had changed that policy on, on the buses and trains. So it happened really quickly. <coughs> So this is what Extinction Rebellion have done. Um, 180 people were arrested in October and November last year. I was one of those people who was arrested. Um, I think Extinction Rebellion has a different energy, a new, a new kind of energy. It's capturing, it's doing something slightly different that's capturing things in a different way. And I think it's also got the advantage of timing that things are really, really, really urgent. Um, I do want to say something about getting arrested briefly, though. Um, we are incredibly privileged. We're incredibly privileged to be in a country where you can call a meeting with 350 people here and, and I'll, you know, shout about rebellion and not expect people to be bashing on the door on guards. But also, my own experience of getting arrested was a very privileged one. Um, I'm white, I'm middle class, and I can navigate bureaucracies very easily. And if I had been, you know, a young black man or somebody with, um, mental health problems, or if I looked unconventional with piercings and tattoos, you would get treated very differently by the police. So I did definitely want to just kind of acknowledge that. And some of you might be sitting there thinking, God, well this is all great, and I know the waitress thing was really bad, but mm, this all sounds a bit too much, I'm not sure, and you know, maybe we should just go through the proper channels for a bit longer, <laughs> maybe. Maybe we should get some more Green MPs, or maybe we should green up Labour, or maybe we should green up the Conservatives, or maybe we should do a social media thing, or maybe we should have a march, or maybe we should be smaller, we should be neater, or quieter, or just a bit less distracted. Or maybe somebody else will do it. Maybe this is all very well, but not you and not your family. Maybe. Yeah? It's possible. But really, we are facing four degrees plus of warming and the window by which we can act is closing literally month by month. That is the situation we're in. And we are still able to change policy. So if we act now, we can actually change things and every fraction of a degree of warming that we stop will make a difference to the lives of millions of people. Every single fraction of a degree of warming that we prevent. And this leads me to another really important point. With climate change, it's not like where you're fighting Brexit and if you stop it happening, it doesn't happen and you know it's not going to happen and then everything's fine because you can say it didn't happen and we sorted that out. We can still change policies and those fractions of degree of warming are really, really important. But Things are going to get really bad, like, regardless. And so, you're in a slightly difficult or conflicting position, because on one hand, you can do something and you can change policies, and we have got power still. But on the other hand, it might not seem like we, we might not win. Like, there is no win, there's no end point. And so, you have to kind of sit with those two kind of uncomfortable things both at the same time. And I think the second point, that things are going to get really, really bad, it does lead you to, to examine your deepest motivations. It's like, do you just act because you're going to win? Do you just kind of, or do you just take action anyway? And I think it goes back to your very, very core values about who you are and why you're doing things. So I'm finishing now, you'll be pleased to know. Um, only two more slides. This is Kate Marble. 
Uh, she is a top climate scientist. And this is her take on the whole kind of motivation and why, why you might want to act thing. As a climate scientist, I'm often asked to talk about hope. Climate change is bleak, the organizers say. Tell us a happy story. Give us some hope. The problem is, I don't have any. What we need is courage. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Zahora and Rachel. So you're just going to get five minutes from me now. What I'm going to talk about is practicalities. Um, what we're building up to at the moment as, as uh, a rebellion is International Rebellion Week, which starts on the 15th of April. And what that involves is basically we're going to bring London to a standstill. As, uh, as Zahora already said, we had 6,000 people who did basically that uh, briefly, like for, for, for a bit of a day in, in November. But we're going to do it again, we're going to do it in greater numbers, and we're going to do it for a much longer time now. So you'll notice perhaps uh, that the 15th of April is a Monday. We're starting on a Monday, we'll be still going on a Tuesday, we'll be still going on Wednesday, I expect, and so on and so on. So um, we do have the numbers now as, as, a, as a rebellion to, to create very severe economic disruption in London. And it's essentially going to be economic disruption through street party. Um, the plans are that uh, we will simply occupy the major junctions of London and we will stop the traffic in London by being there, um, engaging in street parties, but not just partying, also discussion, teachings, all, all those kinds of things. There's, there's probably going to be some meditation going on. <laughs> like, those, those, the kind of things, but essentially we're going to be uh, ordinary people doing very unusual things uh, because of the, the situation. So, um, yeah, so Zahora's talked about, she's talked about getting arrested, she's talked about how, uh, how philosophy is just, it doesn't matter if we win or not, it's about living well and doing the right thing. I, I, there's different currents of an extinction rebellion. I, I, I want to win, and I, I think we realistically can. By the way, the whole point about that 3.5% figure is that every single one of the, of the uprisings uh, that, that uh, Eric Chenoweth analysed that uh, were non-violent and involved 3.5% of the population were successful in achieving their aims. So that, that's where the 3.5% comes from. And I think we can be successful. I think these movements, the Extinction Rebellion and the school strike, are growing rapidly enough that it's not impossible that we could force the government to uh, make concessions to us. And in fact, the, the, um, there are, actually I'm not going to talk about the Gilets Jaunes, they're, they're not a non-violent movement, but they did, they did get concessions uh, by being on the streets. Uh, we don't need their violence though. Um, okay, so, uh, by the way, that's my kid. Uh, he's playing Nintendo on Black Forest Bridge, where the, the, the cars are supposed to be driving in, in November. Nice one, Otis. Uh, <laughs> sorry to embarrass you. The point I'm making there is that uh, um, it, these kinds of things are actually pretty safe. You don't get arrested unless you want to. Um, of those 6,000 people that were blocking bridges in, in, in November, the only ones that got arrested were the ones who stayed behind to deliberately get arrested. The police can't arrest a bridge full of a thousand people. They, the, 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 the neoliberalism has hollowed out the state, so I think I'm quoting someone. <laughs> they can't do it, they can't arrest uh, thousands of us in, 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 in London. And, uh, and so I'll be taking my children again, expecting not to get arrested. Probably not to get arrested. I do emphasize that <coughs> you should, if you, if you do something illegal, it, it's responsible to, to anticipate there's a possibility you should get you could get arrested and you should be prepared for that. Um, there will be a big group travelling from Oxford. Uh, I think we're ready for that slide in a minute. Uh, um, last time this last time was literally about a month or two after the movement started and 30 of us went from Oxford. There's gonna be a lot more this time. If you want to get involved uh, 
Yeah, let's go for that slide now. Uh, yeah, so um, we are, we take preparation very seriously. Uh, before the 15th of April, when Rebellion Week uh, starts, there will be many opportunities for new rebels to get more acquainted with the movement, come and meet us, come and find out how we operate, um, find out about um, uh, the legal issues with the, our legal training, uh, find out about more about how to be non-violent when, when uh, get trained in that, um, and you know just uh, basically get get involved. There's all kinds of ways to get involved, even if you absolutely can't do anything that has any chance of getting you arrested. We we completely understand and respect that there are many people for whatever reason they absolutely can't take that risk. We want you to join the rebellion anyway, please. It's not just about doing things that, that might get you arrested. It, there are all kinds of ways you can support the movement. Uh, probably many of you are here tonight because someone put a leaflet through your door, for example. That's, that, that's absolutely crucial, those kinds of things. Another thing you can do is join the Earth March. So that there's some local rebels who are, who are very involved in organising the Earth March. This is a, 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 what they're basically doing is they're going to Rebellion Week, but they're walking. And this is in the, the old tradition of, of marching through the country, uh, the earth beneath your feet, basically. Uh, it's a symbolic thing, uh, and you can do that, and that's uh, the kind of thing you can do if you absolutely can't risk arrest. Um, so, yes, um, and I think I basically said what I needed to say. Uh, in a minute, uh, you're going to hear from George Monbiot again. Uh, but for, before George, I'll just check out if I missed anything out. Um, yeah, before George, I'm going to pass over to Lynette, who, and she is a 16 year old school striker, and she's got uh, an address to make.
Now, it is your turn to affirm that you will represent us. It can sometimes feel like each individual can't make a difference, but that is where we are wrong. True, if every individual who feels disempowered did nothing, then there'll be no change. But if every individual who would have done nothing does something, then we can fight this. One of the most empowering things about this movement is that it reaches out to anyone. You don't have to have already regarded yourself as an activist. It reaches out for anyone, regardless of who you are, or what you have already done. And that applies to everyone. We all have something in our power to give. I want to have a beautiful, sustainable world to live in. I want to have the chance to go out and see the sun and the birds and the trees. I want to have the chance to not live in fear of being flooded or caught up in wildfires and droughts. I want to have the chance to live. And at the moment, it's not happening that way. And I'm not getting it. Last year, the report said that we only have 12 years to make a difference. 12 years? It looks like, it looks like you're going to have to act now. By the time I am 80, we will have had around four degrees of warming if we don't significantly change our system. Will I be the last generation to become old? The suffragettes rebelled by campaigning for a voice. We need to rebel by campaigning for that voice to be listened to. For young people, that starts by getting you to listen to us, to affirm that you will represent us too. Because we have all seen the statistics. We have all read the articles, but are you listening? If you are, then what could possibly prevent you from acting? Thank you. I just want to send a shout out to the people that are outside. I can see them. There are some people that uh, they're waving. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry that we didn't book a bigger venue. We just didn't realise the extent of this movement. Well, thank you everyone for those fantastic presentations. And yeah, we need to be scared in order to see how much we have to do, and then we need to do it. Now, people often ask me, am I optimistic or am I pessimistic? And my answer is that I'm pessimistic about what people are doing, doing to each other, doing to this wonderful planet, but I'm optimistic about what we are. Because old Thomas Hobbes was wrong. <laughs> we are not engaged in a war of all against all. It's simply not true. He could be forgiven for believing that. He just witnessed the ravages of the English Civil War. He believed in the doctrine of original sin. His understanding of um, evolutionary biology was confined to the book of Genesis. <laughs> but today, we know it is simply wrong. There's a huge amount of scientific work across many different fields. Neuroscience, anthropology, evolutionary biology, social psychology showing that while we all have a bit of selfishness and greediness, in the majority of people, that's down here. That those are values, uh, characteristics, 
that are not dominant. They're subordinate to our principal values, which it turns out are altruism, empathy, community feeling, benevolence, wanting other people to be okay. And yet, we are constantly assured that we're not like this at all. In fact, it's almost the doctrine of our age that we are inherently selfish and greedy, and this is a good thing. Because this can be leveraged as the invisible hand in the market which is going to deliver all good things to everybody because in pursuing our self-interest, of course, um, according to neoliberal uh, theology, I was going to say ideology, but it's actually theology, according to neoliberal theology, uh, this invisible hand with its godlike properties <coughs> will actually enrich everybody and then everybody becomes happier by being selfish and greedy. Well, um, they think it makes sense. But it is simply founded on a fallacy. Um, the science does not support it at all. It is, it is nonsense. It is, it is junk science, which is at the root of that ideology. Broadly speaking, we're a society of altruists governed by psychopaths. <laughs> and I mean it. Actually, again, the science shows very clearly that those uh, people in positions of power Many of them are radically different to the human norm. <laughs> they seem to be missing those components, altruism and empathy in particular, that the rest of us possess. And in this case, selfishness and greed really are at the top of the list. This is where we're going wrong, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Why are we letting these bastards rule us? <laughs> There's a very interesting analysis by um, Kenneth Mackay, a, a Canadian um, um, professor of sociology, who's, who's looked at the cultures that have become extinct, where um, they should have been to one of these talks, but um, they, uh, because they didn't, they, they, they went over the edge and they slipped into the extinction that we're talking about as a prospect, a possibility for humanity in general now. And he was saying, well, what is the common characteristic of all these cultures? Is it that they became over-complex? Is it that they had a particular way of engaging with, with the living world, which was disastrous, or with each other, were they particularly warlike? And what he found was that the common denominator was they were all governed by oligarchies, by a very small number of people who had almost absolute power over everybody else. And that the interests the short-term interests of the oligarchs were radically different to the long-term interests of society. And so that, though everybody else might have wanted to do things differently, these people were saying, our interests are pursued by doing it this way. Now, does that seem at all familiar with the 21st century? You know, we think about the Koch brothers, we think about Donald Trump, we think about Exxon, we think about BP, we think about this tiny handful of billionaires and corporations who want to do it their way, regardless of the impacts on the rest of us. And then we think of the rest of society who are either indifferent or in denial or really want things to be different, but the great majority of people are not saying, actually, we want to be hell-bound towards extinction because that suits our short-term <laughs> interests. Now, I'm not saying that even the Koch brothers are saying we want everybody to become extinct, though one or two of their um, fellow billionaires, Peter Thiel being an example, seems, seem to be heading in that direction. Um, but they will pursue their interests regardless of whether we become extinct or not. Because for them, that short-term interest, the money in the bank, their place on the world rich list, their power over governments is the thing that counts, and the rest is irrelevant. Now, what we see is some version of this reflected in most of the mainstream media. Now, to own a newspaper or a television company, you have to be a billionaire. And so the world is portrayed to us by people who are radically different from the rest of us, not just in terms of the amount of money they have in the bank, but generally in terms of their psychological profile as well. And they're telling us, this is how it is, this is how people are, this is how they behave. And you say, well, that maybe is how you are and how you behave, 
but it's not how the rest of us are. But again and again, what is in the media is mistaken for public opinion. I'm constantly being asked, well, people don't think like you're thinking. People don't think like that. And you say, well, well, on what basis? Well, look, look at it in the Daily Mail. And you say, what you mean, Lord Rothermere's opinions, this tax exile based in France, telling us how we should live in Britain? I don't think so. I don't think that's representative somehow. Rupert Murdoch, is he representative? The weirdo Barclay brothers, are they representative? These people are not our friends, and these people are not us. They live apart, literally and metaphorically. And yet, they determine to a large extent our view of ourselves. And there's a variant on this that I come across all the time, particularly from TV executives who say, oh, people aren't interested in environmental stuff. And I'm now meeting journalists from around the world who say, they're constantly bumping up against this. They, they perceive a great public appetite to hear about environmental stuff. And again and again, the, the people running the TV stations, the people running the newspapers are telling them, oh, no one's interested in that. And they say, well, how do you know? And they say, oh, well, no one's interested. Well, you might not be, but that doesn't mean no one is. Now, just today, I, I was told a really interesting thing by a, a TV producer. And he said that, you know these audience figures that you get for programmes which say 8 million people watch this programme? They have no means at all of knowing that 8 million people watch this, this programme because it's a sampling process they have. There are 2,000 people around the country who have a box in their homes which shows what they're watching and they extrapolate from those 2,000 to try to get an impression of what the nation as a whole is watching. What he told me today is that because of insurance reasons, you cannot have one of those boxes in your house unless you own your own home. <laughs> so it turns out that all these audience figures and all these perceptions of what people are watching are confined to people who own their own home, which, as we know, is a particular section of the population. And then years later, the TV executives start scratching their heads and say, why are no young people watching our programmes? <laughs> because all the programmes they've been producing have been tailored for those 2,000 people, who probably over the years have been the same 2,000 people, so they're all about 85 now. <laughs> and so they keep saying, no, you're not interested. And I'm telling you, you're not interested, all right? You're not interested. You aren't here. This isn't happening. This is why I'm optimistic, because what I see is that when people are exposed to what is happening, when people are given the opportunity to act, enough people are ready to do it. And with Extinction Rebellion, with the youth climate strikes, we are seeing the rising that I have been waiting for for the 33 years of my campaigning life. I honour these people, I want us all to honour them, and I want us to see that this is the beginning, not at the end, but the beginning of the beginning, the beginning of the great mass movement so many of us have been hoping to see for so long. It starts this year, ladies and gentlemen, and it starts with us. Thank you. Questions. Uh, George was okay. So we're actually going to do a paper slip system because um, the, there's so many people around here. So it, uh, and we don't think we'll be able to hear the questions basically. So uh, someone just stood up there. Joe is waving. The, the, can you stand up if you've got a paper, piece of paper? Basically, get a piece of paper up here. Uh, it's it's probably going to be sort of roughly first come first serve and uh, with with questions that this guy's got bits of paper here. If you've got a question you want to ask, write it down.